Hello Year 12, welcome back. Um, today we will be looking at the poem Circular Breathing by Jaya Savage. So if you could please, again, make sure you have the poem in front of you um, and um, something to take notes with, um, that would be fantastic. Okay, so what we will be doing, um, as we always do before we go into the actual poem, is we're going to be looking at some of the context for the actual composer himself. So. Um, remember also, this is obviously a part of your module A study. So this is one of the six poems um, that we will, we will be looking at. Okay, so a little bit about the composer himself. So Jaya was born in Sydney in 1978. Um, he grew up in Queensland on Bribie Island and boarded at St. Joseph's College in Nudgee, which is a small little town there in Queensland. Um, so he attended the University of Queensland. He studied English and was awarded for his efforts studying Shakespeare and Keats. So they are obviously, you know, who Shakespeare is, but Keats is a um, uh, mainly a poet as well. Um, so it's really interesting that the last three composers we've looked at have all had um, a very strong connection to um, prolific writers, especially prolific poets. And Jaya is obviously no exception. Um, and he currently works at a university um, within the creative writing department. And I believe it might be even the head of the creative writing department there, but he's definitely a lecturer or a, like a teacher there. Okay. Um, we're going to dive straight into the actual poem itself. It's quite a brief poem. Um, you don't need a lot of background context historically because it's stuff that you should know already. Um, but yeah, we'll just dive straight into it. Um, so the actual poem title itself is obviously called Circular Breathing and underneath it has a little tagline there for, for Samuel Wagon Watson. So um, from what I can gather, Samuel Wagon Watson is an, an Indigenous poet himself um, and he's quite well known um, for his poetry, specifically about the effects of colonisation um, on in the Indigenous population and like the ongoing effects as well. Um, so... Um, this poem has quite a lot to do with the ideas of colonization and the idea of um, Aboriginal culture. So it makes sense in that regard that Jaya has dedicated this poem to Samuel uh, Wagon Watson. Um, I've also just popped a little image there on the right hand side um, of a man actually playing the didgeridoo. Um, more so because we are talking about the actual title itself, Circular Breathing. So, if you're unfamiliar with the term itself, um, as far as what I've researched, essentially it's the technique of you, as you're playing the actual didgeridoo, and this applies to other woodwind instruments as well, which requires you to blow into it. Um, you're breathing through your nose as you're blowing the air out into the actual instrument. So this person isn't actually, they are taking breath, but they're not taking the instrument away from themselves to, to take breath. So if you think about the way that the air kind of circles into their body and out of their body in that circular motion, that's essentially where this term circular breathing comes from. So it's very much, a, has a strong connection to, um, in this case, uh, playing a didgeridoo. Okay, so we're going to go straight into the actual poem itself. As I've said in previous videos, if you have not read the poem yet, can you please do so? Um, because that will obviously uh, allow you to understand <laughs> what we're talking about a, a lot better. So pause it right now, go watch the video. Um, I've, I've set up this particular video like the previous one where I'm not actually typing as I'm going. I've, I've typed it out already. So if I'm going a little bit too fast, obviously you can still pause and write down any notes. Um, and then we will discuss those later in our lesson together. Okay. And also there's some um, Italian words in here. So if I pronounce them wrong, I'm like, look, I apologize. Okay. All right. So we're going to start off obviously with the first stanza. Um, okay. So I'll just read it out first and then we'll go from there. Okay. So there's a man with dreadlocks playing the didgeridoo in the Piazza di Santa Maria and everyone is listening. Kids sit by the fountain swapping smokes for laughs. Tourists lick gelati as they pass illicit markets. Belts, handbags, sunglasses, all made in... The place scratched off. Nuns halt. Then the carabinera. Carabinieri? White gloves, black steel-capped boots glistening. Okay, so if we're going to start pulling apart some of the ideas within this first line, um, very the very first line, the first thing we're introduced to is there's this man. We have no idea who he is, but this characterization that's created through um, Savage's 
descriptions gives us a little bit of an insight as to who this man is. So we've got um, a characterization here. It alludes to the pers a person of color. And the way that we can kind of make those um, contextual uh, links is because culturally dreadlocks are associated with non-European cultures. After doing a little bit of research, um, traditionally, and some Indigenous Australians have worn their hair in a locked style. Um, that paired with the fact that he's obviously talking about a didgeridoo, which I'll get to in a moment, it's making, a, a, I think, a strong connection to the fact that this person who's playing this didgeridoo may be Indigenous. Um, we are seeing as well in that first line, right next to that second line, there's a man with dreadlocks playing the didgeridoo in the Piazza di Santa Maria and everyone is listening. The Piazza di Santa Maria is a, a an old church in Rome, in Italy. So, we've got an immediate contrast between this European culture in Rome and obviously this um, Aboriginal Indigenous culture. So, it's possibly a deliberate representation of um, Christianity uh, in terms of the location where we are at, because as we go on, as I said, we, this poem is very heavily about colonization and um, Christian settlers were a, a large forefront of a lot of places around the world being um, colonized or invaded. So possibly that's what the, um, the poet is trying to hint at here, but we will shall continue either way. Um, obviously, yep, there's a clear connection to Australian culture, as I said before, through those descriptions in that first line. Um, and that, that contrast, we can describe it as a juxtaposition because both lines are right next to each other. So, there's this juxtaposition between two ancient cultures. We've got Roman culture and we've got the um, Indigenous Australian culture as well. Okay, so as the um, descriptions continue, as we're describing the kids sitting by the fountain, swapping smokes for laughs, etc., we've got this auditory imagery coming through, swapping smokes, that sibilance is coming through again. Um, alongside this visual imagery, um, is it's painting a clear picture in our mind as the reader. So, we're, we're almost visualizing sitting there. If you've ever, you know, either seen Rome in a movie or you've been to Rome, if you're lucky enough to be there, You've got all this ancient architecture around you and you can almost picture people sitting there at a fountain, like a Trevi fountain or something like that. Um, there'd be lots of tourists there. It's a massive tourist attraction. Gelati would be a, a national um, dessert, I'd imagine, for Italy. But it immediately starts going to, as they pass, illicit markets. Illicit meaning illegal or something that you shouldn't have. Um they got belts, handbags, sunglasses, all made in blank. There's no gen genuinity. Genuity? Genuity? I think that's the word. Genuinity. Let's, <laughs> let's go with that. Um, the place scratched off. So, we don't know where it's from. Um, it's fraudulent. Um, these are not authentic items. Okay? There's no authenticity there. Um, Carabin Carabinieri is an Italian law enforcement. I believe they're actually a type of military police from what I researched. Um, so, interestingly, you've got these law enforcement um, officers coming in. And originally when I read this, I thought it was them coming in to maybe stop them selling these illicit belts, handbags, sunglasses, etc. Um, but as we progress, they may be possibly symbolic of something else, maybe a... a, a um, symbolic of authority. And if I'm kind of getting, I'm picking up on the ideas that we've already discussed, possibly they could be the authority figures who invaded, in this case, Australia. This idea of this um, powerful European authority, possibly, but we'll move on. Um, and, and, sorry, the other reason why I think that it too is there's a juxtaposition here in that very last line. Um, it's continued through the contrast of black and white. So, we've got the Carabinini, white gloves, black steel capped boots glistening. Look, that could just be the description of the, um, of the officers, but, you know, it's completely up to our interpretation of the poem. And for me, the way that I interpret that is it's possibly a commentary on uh, this violent contrast between Indigenous culture and European culture, obviously black versus white, that, um, that definite dichotomy coming up there. Okay, so we're going to move on to our second stanza um, for this particular poem. So, the crowd hems the young musician in, faces glazed with wonder, from where could this strange music have come? Surely not this hemisphere. 
a drone as deep as yet unexcavated ruins, far older even than the forum, Armani, Ray-Ban, Dolce and Gabbana, all sink at once into equivalence. So, we're almost getting this image here that this crowd has become almost protective of this musician. As these these police, Carabinetti, come in, or these law enforcement officers are coming in, the crowd's almost protecting this musician in some way. They're, they're, they're hemmed the musician in. Um, and by extension, it's not just the musician that they're protecting. It's almost like they're protecting this culture, this ancient culture. They are drawn in by their curiosity and they shield it almost from the police or this authority figure. You've got this rhetorical question that's being posed to us by the speaker. Um, re- reflects the, uh, the crowd's curiosity when he says... Um, from where could this strange music have come? But he immediately answers it. And what we call that in terms of poetry, even speeches as well, is um, hyperphora. So, if there's a, a question that's then immediately answered, um, hyperphora, hypophora, however you want to pronounce it. So, the reader has immediately answered this question. This shows that the music is so foreign that there is no way that it could be part of this culture. There's no other answer for it. It, it, it just can't be a part of this culture. It's Surely, it's not from this hemisphere. It must be foreign. And that almost isolates, again, harkening back to the last couple of poems we've looked at, it almost isolates this culture as the other again. The idea that this is strange, this is foreign, this is not where it's meant to be. But it's not as negative as the the previous poems um, because there's some sort of appreciation there for for this music that's being played. Um, We do have a bit of onomatopoeia coming up through here as well in the, the, the word drone. Um, the drone itself is like a low humming noise. Um, so the auditory language used here to reflect the sounds of the didgeridoo makes. Usually it is that, that very deep, very low, um, droning, um, noise that is created through that particular instrument. You've got a simile coming up here as it's being described, uh, a drone as deep as, as yet unexcavated ruins, far older even than the forum. So it's used to compare the ancient culture, um, in ancient indigenous culture and, and emphasizes how this culture, how all this culture is, sorry, is in comparison to European history. Um, I'll just draw your attention up to the top there, that red box. So if we look at the dates from the information that we have so far, so ancient Rome dates back roughly 280 centuries. So 2,800 years, whereas Aboriginal history dates back to over 40,000 years. And that number keeps fluctuating because there's more and more finds that are being, um, or more and more evidence that's being found, um, some say even over 50,000 years. So, obviously, in comparison there, the Indigenous Australian culture is far older than ancient Rome. Um, Yet, there seems to be some interesting uh, commentary when... Um, the speaker talks about it's far older even than the forum, Armani, Ray-Ban, Dolce & Gabbana. These are all, hopefully, or maybe, you know, I don't know, all types of clothing accessories or, or um, commercial accessories. Some of them aren't even actually owned by Italian designers anymore and they've, they've been Americanized or Westernized. So, all of these modern and commercial representations of Italian culture... This is sometimes what people think of. And even like the idea of tourism itself is very commercialized. And that's when we go back to that first stanza and we talk about the fact that people are flocking to Rome, this ancient city, to appreciate this culture. But they're actually just there, um, a lot of them at least, to get, you know, knockoff versions of their favorite ba- uh, bags or belts, or sunglasses or whatever it may be. So... It's almost a commentary or a critique on how um, meaningless cultural consumerism is and how um, vapid some of uh, these cultures have really become. But this traditional music that has not been altered, has not been changed, it's just the musicians still playing this traditional instrument, that's what people appreciate. And it's so old, but it hasn't been changed by this commercial culture. Okay, we're going to move on to our, our, I believe this is the third stanza. So, we come back now to the actual sounds and the the didgeridoo and the the musician playing. And the speaker says, He doesn't do the kangaroo, the mosquito or the speeding Holden, just the one dark, warm, lush hum, the clean energy of circular breathing, 
lungs and instrument the sum, familiar as the accordion, yet strange, as though not for money, not just for fun, but for reasons unknowable, some vast, unhurried om. So, for a bit of background knowledge, kangaroo, mosquito, speeding, hold on, although I haven't heard of the last one, um, but obviously it's in reference to the car. Kangaroo, Mosquito, Speeding Holden are all sounds or song lines that can be played on the didgeridoo. And they can be played on other instruments as well, other traditional um, Aboriginal instruments. But obviously in this case, we're referring to the didgeridoo. Um, So, through music, it's almost a commentary here, but through music, this culture has survived and outlasted all other cultures. And it harkens back to that previous stanza where this Italian culture, this um, European culture has become so commercialized that nothing's authentic anymore. Everything is almost um, disingenuous. Oh, that's the word I was thinking about before. Genuinity? I don't think that's the word. Anyway, it's almost become disingenuous. Well, it has become disingenuous. Whereas this culture is the oldest culture known to man and it is still completely authentic. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got auditory imagery coming through here through the this very um, long description, dark, warm, lush hum. So, lush hum. Again, that hum kind of pairs well with the the, to the description of the drone. It's a, a humming sound. Um, it's almost inviting to, to hear warm, dark, warm, lush hum. It's something that someone wants to be a part of and someone wants some, something that someone wants to listen to. It's, there's absolutely no negative... Um, imagery being created around that here. And again, it's being paired there with this positive connotation of clean energy. It's not it's not dirty. It's not just energy. It's clean energy. It's something that someone wants to be a part of. Um, so, we've got a clear natural connection between the player, or the musician, I should say, sorry, and the instrument. They are one. The culture belongs to him as he belongs to the culture. And again, that kind of references back to this idea of circular. It's this idea, it goes around in a circle, it's, it's all connected, okay? The same way that this person is connected to their culture, the culture is connected to them, there is no break in it. The same way that this person is playing the instrument, there is no break in the way that they are playing. It's circular. Okay, so this music transcends monetary gain in terms of this culture can't be bought, this music can't be bought. He's, this person is not playing this instrument for money. They're not playing it for their own personal gain or for just for fun. There's some sort of p- spiritual connection and there's a reason for its existence. It's unknowable, so people don't know why, but there's just that fascination and the energy that, that's created through this instrument. There's something special about this culture that it's made it last for so long and outlast all the other cultures, even when other cultures try to destroy it. And that's really important because we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, And then the term om here, from my research, it translates to monks. So, my interpretation, again, is that it might be some sort of spiritual connection or spiritual imagery that's created here. This culture is spiritual. Um, Okay. And possibly why it's survived for so long. Okay. And we'll go to our last stanza now. So, I want to bolt up the stairs of the fountain and claim that sound as a sound of my home, but stop when I recall how rarely I... I slow to hear the truer player busking in King George Square. Memory kinks my measured walk into a lurch. My stomach fills with fire. Far above cold stars wheel around the spire of Rome's oldest Christian church. Um, so the way that I'm interpreting this, this person's hearkening and thinking back to, back to home for them, back to Australia, King George Square, which I believe is in Sydney. So, they're thinking back to their home um, and, and what they're seeing there. Um, and the fact that they didn't appreciate that culture back home, but they're appreciating it overseas instead. So, there's a beauty of the Indigenous culture on foreign shores. There's a stark realisation for the speaker that at home, they don't value it the same. They don't give the attention or respect it deserves at home. And it almost makes this question, why is that? We've got a sasura coming through again. Um, you should be familiar with that by now. But it's that deliberate pause as the speaker reflects and asks us to reflect also. So, they claim the sound as the sound of my home, but they pause there, they stop. 
and literally it says in the next line, but stop when I recall how rarely I slow to hear the truer player busking in King George Square. Makes us question, can we actually claim a culture that is not ours? And why is it that we appreciate a culture um, when we are away or when we are in um, a foreign land? And why don't we appreciate it when it's right in front of us? We've got a metaphor coming through here um, with the term there, my stomach fills with fire. It doesn't obviously literally fill with fire. Um, but we have a metaphor here for the guilt or and or possibly the shame that the speaker feels about the ignorance towards indigenous culture. So he feels bad for the fact that he's realizing he doesn't appreciate this culture um, when he's home. Why is that? He feels horrible. And that's the way he's described that feeling. Um, it almost brings us up to the, to the end here, but there's that lack of his own appreciation. There's a failure to acknowledge this ancient culture. As I said before, there's that shame, both at what Christianity did to the indigenous people as colonizers represent the negative. So obviously, you know, the story of Australia's invasion um, and how European settlers did obviously invade Australia um, and which led to a, a complete massacre of the indigenous population. Um, this is represented through Christianity and Christianity being the forefront of European colonizers essentially at the time. So amongst the chaos of commercialism, the familiar sound reminds him of the beauty of his cultural ancestry and how he takes it for granted. So it's like he's learned a lesson from this. Um, I also thought um, it was quite interesting here towards the end there, far above the cold stars wheel around the spire of Rome's oldest Christian church. So this Christian institution is responsible essentially for the attempted destruction of this culture through colonization, through the invasion of Australia. It's ironic because um, this culture now is, is being admired on its very own doorsteps. It's literally, there's a person there um, showcasing this culture, showcasing how proud they are of this culture and that this culture survived this attempted um, colonization, this attempted um, basically desecration of the entire culture. And they are there in their homeland now showing their culture. Okay, so that brings us up to the end of that poem. It was a quick one. Um, so, again... I will see you guys in our next lesson. I'm very excited to have a discussion with you about the ideas within this poem itself. Um, so please make sure that you bring your annotated poem and a list of comprehensive notes so we can dive straight into it. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.